Hi, Jamie Davis, the pod medic for Innovations in Patient Care. We're here at EMS Today 2013 in Washington, D.C., and we've got a great lineup of people that are going to be coming on the show in the coming weeks, and I'm really excited to kick off this set of interviews with Mark Whitbread. And Mark, you are the paramedic, con paramedic consultant for the London Ambul Ambulance Service. And a lot of people don't know what a paramedic consultant is, but you are the clinical uh, person at the top of the game there at, 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 for paramedics in, in the London Ambulance Service. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there are nine consultant paramedics in the UK, and it's, if you like, the highest position you can go within the paramedic career structure. Uh, the UK has introduced the career structure for paramedics where you start as a basic EMT and you gradually work your way up. Now in most UK ambulance services to access uh, the program to become a paramedic is via higher education so you come out with a university degree. So the top end of that spectrum is a consultant paramedic. So I'm fortunate enough to be the first appointed in London. Fantastic. Tell us a little bit about your background in EMS. How did you get started? Uh, what, what, was your, where, what were your roots in EMS? Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I, the National Health Service, which is the government uh, structure for providing health care in the UK, uh, so I've been in the National Health Service for 31 years. I'm just starting my, uh, coming up to my 32nd year. Uh, having said that, my father w was in the original London Ambulance Service before it changed over to government being run by okay. the government, so we're going back many years ago. Uh, so my introduction into the ambulance service essentially was through my father, who was a, a station officer in the old days of ambulance services. Uh, and so that's how I got into having an interest, if you like. And then I started off working in renal dialysis. Uh, I was an anaesthetic, I've trained in anaesthetics as an anaesthetic technician and worked abroad in Holland and places like that. And then I've been teaching paramedics uh, for about 20, 22 years. And then it came to a point where the London Ambulance Service want, wanted to refocus itself in relation to cardiac care. So I started to work for the London Ambulance Service about 15 years ago, uh, purely focusing on cardiac care, although I'd been teaching the London Ambulance Service for over 20 years. And then that turned into the position I'm in now. And so gradually, I've in, over the last 15 years, uh, having dealt mainly with cardiac and stroke and major trauma and areas like that, progressed to consultant paramedic. My background is uh, I have a master's degree in cardiology. Mm -hmm. So my main interest is in acute cardiac care. And there's some really exciting things going on in acute cardiac care in the London Ambulance Service. you really setting a standard for top to bottom care from the initial call to 999 or what we call 911 and all the way up through uh, patient discharge with, with major cardiac events. Absolutely. Uh, we've, we've got a package, if you like, uh, and I've always said that there's never a silver bullet to improve cardiac care. It has to be a whole package. And so I've tried to tackle that package bit by bit from various angles. So for example, we have a community resuscitation team mm -hmm. that teach BLS, uh, an AED to the community free of charge. We then have a community defibrillation team that focuses on putting the AEDs into public places. So we have over 700 AEDs across mm. London uh, in the major tourist attractions, the major transport hubs across London. Uh, and then we move on to sort of our dispatch centre uh, where we offer chest compressions only CPR over the telephone. Uh, we're very good at quality controlling that. Uh, our system within the dispatch centre is, is very good at identifying a cardiac arrest. Once we identify a cardiac arrest, we call it a red one. So a red one is our highest category of call and response. So we mobilise usually on average three separate units to a cardiac arrest. So we send multiple personnel in the same way that Seattle do. Uh, so we've looked at what Seattle does, for example, and, and where we can duplicate that. That's what we've done. Uh, and we're taking it a little bit step further, so we, we've got robust guidelines for how paramedics manage a cardiac arrest. We're not so eager to rush the patient to hospital like we were years ago. We're focusing on our care. And then we're introducing slowly but surely little bits, uh, data download so that we can feed back to staff. Uh, we're exploring therapeutic hypothermia. So we're doing a load of bits, if you like, that make the package of care for cardiac arrest. And then on the other hand, we have the STEMI patients. And probably that's the biggest area where we've had a major, major impact on patients in London. Uh, and we activate the cath labs. We have eight cath labs in London. They're known as heart attack centres. Uh, and paramedics and EMTs activate the cath lab direct. So that we don't transmit an ECG. Some would say we should. 
but our average running time to a cath lab is 16 minutes. So by the time we've transmitted mm. the ECG and had some sort of conversation, we're pulling up at the cath lab doors. Uh, and that's probably been one of the major changes that we introduced. We were the first UK ambulance service to introduce a city-wide PCI program of taking confirmed STEMIs to a cath lab. And what, do, what do you say about the, the, the people out there that say that having your paramedics EMS personnel call the STEMI in the field is, is not a good use of resources? Uh, I would disagree. Uh, <laughs> the, way we teach, the way we teach the staff is perhaps slightly, will, will, will appear slightly odd to some people. Uh, my belief is it's not the paramedic or the technician's job to say that it's a STEMI or not a STEMI. The paramedic and technician's job is to identify the ST elevation and chest pain. And if they believe it's a STEMI, they take it to the cath lab. So we expect our staff to identify ST elevation with cardiac chest pain and activate the cath lab. And we leave it for the expert interventionalist at the cath lab to say it is or it isn't. Uh, and that way it works. And no system, no system anywhere will get it, up, get it right 100% of the time. So we build in a false activation factor. And so when a cath lab wants to come on board and provide the service in London, there are certain hurdles, if you like, that they have to overcome before we will start delivering patients. So they have to provide a 24-7 service. There's a no refusal basis. So they have to accept an activation. Uh, and they have to accept that it won't be 100% right because no system will be 100% right. So, but we, we've, this, we're going back years. So we started this in the end of 2005. So we've, we've got a lot of experience of going to mm -hmm. heart attack centers. And that's what's led to our next development. We're the first ambulance service that I know of in the world where we now activate emergency arrhythmia centers. So we're now taking patients who have got wide complex tachycardia or complete heart block or multiple device activations direct to an emergency arrhythmia center where they're assessed by an arrhythmia specialist. So that's, that's new. I don't know of anywhere else in no. the world that's doing that. And, and w that's a great innovation because it, it, it gives us uh, yet again, another type of specialization to get the right patient to the right destination. Within the right time frame. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's not just a question of bypassing hospitals for the sake of bypassing hospitals. As you say, it's, it's about taking the patient to the right place. Uh, so we have emergency arrhythmia centers, we have heart attack centers. The heart attack centers now take what we call high risk ACS patients. So those with the ST depression or the obvious T wave inversion with ongoing ischemic symptoms. They now, we activate the cath lab for that group of patients because they're a group that needs specialist care. So it's all about identifying uh, cardiac patients who require specialist input. And it has to be recognizable by a paramedic. It has to require specialist input. Uh, and so that's why we're, we're choosing and being careful about how we select what groups of patients are gonna go where. The same as we do with stroke, so all our all our fast positive strokes, for example, go to a hyperacute stroke unit. And so our, 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 our next two phases, if you like, of the whole package would be the complex vascular cases, so the AAA and the acute ischemic limb. And then finally, the icing will be cardiac arrest centers. And then that way, we have a unique uh, cardiovascular service for the high-end patient for everyone in London. That's impressive. And, that's, that's, and, and I, like, I like the fact that there's a vision built into that, that you have a target, a goal from where you're heading, you're, you're implementing stages along the way, and, and you're, ready, uh, you're ready to move on to the next step in the process. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it, no, it, no, no, you're right. It, it is a vision, uh, and, and I believe it to be right. And so mm -hmm. I'm, my mindset is if it's right, then we do it. Clearly, that it's a long road. It's, it's not round the corner. Uh, and I think our biggest challenge is going to be having cardiac arrest hospitals. The reason I say that is, you know, what sort of patient should go to a cardiac arrest hospital? For example, someone in resistant ventricular fibrillation, should they go to a cardiac arrest hospital with ongoing CPR and straight to the cath lab? You know, and how we do that, because that's harder than mm -hmm. what it may appear. It's not a question of just putting the patient into the back of a van and driving. Right. Uh, there's a lot of structure to it. No. We're already taking ROSC patients with ST elevation to a cath lab. Uh, and that's on a non-refusal basis as well. Uh, because obviously, like everywhere, 
uh, the health services in all countries are, are under immense strains, especially, for example, with intensive care beds. Mm -hmm. So we have a non-refusal policy that if we get ROSC with ST elevation, regardless of the presenting rhythm, you're going to a cath lab. And that produces a 60 to 70% survival to discharge. That's amazing. That's for that, for that group amazing. of patients. That's truly amazing. D you had the Code STEMI guys in to uh, feature some of these yes. things in your system, uh, uh, Tom and, and Ted. And uh, what was that experience like, having them come to your system and, and kind of open up and let them take a, take a good, quick look at it? It was an experience. Uh, uh, it would be fair to say that we were very nervous. We were very nervous. Uh, we're not used to having someone watch us in such close detail. And in particular, we're not used to being filmed in such close detail. So there was a lot of nervousness around doing it. And it's ta it took a good year to put together and finalize. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everyone was nervous. Uh, but I have to say, it was one of the most professional outfits that I've ever seen. And so after day one and day two, everyone started to relax a lot more. Uh, but it's the first time our staff, for example, have wore body cameras. Uh, that's the first time we've ever done that in London. So it, w it was interesting. Uh, I think the end result has been fantastic. It's a, a very high quality uh, production. Yeah, and for people quality. watching this, that, that uh, episode's already out. It actually debuts tonight here at the con conference, but it's, uh, uh, it will be available for people at, at that website. And we'll have a link to that. But uh, just, just was curious about your impressions because having uh, to open your system up, you, you kind of expose yourself to, to some uh, scrutiny that you may not be used to, like you said. Exactly. And, and I think probably that's why we were very nervous because, you know, uh, there, were some, there were some funny sides to it. Uh, so, for example, as you see the ambulance uh, going to a call, you see a some candy, a packet of candy sitting on the front of the ambulance. Uh, and everyone was nervous about that because it's not supposed to be there. <laughs> uh, uh, but once you overcome those minor sort of hiccups and everybody starts to relax, it becomes real. And so I think, for me, the film uh, is real. And when you listen to some of the cardiologists talk in the cath lab, uh, some of the things they say, that's real. Uh, and so I think the film is, has been good for London and it'd be good for people to see. And it will really show what it's like. The, you know, it was real fly on the wall type production, if you like. Well, I'm glad they got a chance to feature what you all are doing there. Uh, certainly I've seen their other projects and, and I can't wait to see the episode that premieres tonight yes. and, and uh, see that. And anything you'd like to share with the, the nurses, the ph physicians, paramedics watching innovations in patient care that, that you'd like to, to share about how they should be passionate about cardiac care? I think you've got to realize that there's no easy answer. You've got to realize it's a package and you've got to realize that it's gonna take a long while to get to the end of your package, but you've gotta be persistent. Uh, you've got to take no for an answer and you have to continue to move the boundaries forward because at the end of the day, uh, and, I, and I've said this many, many times, uh, and, and I truly, truly believe it, I come to work not for the glory of being a paramedic. Uh, I come to work because we can make a real, real difference to the patients that we respond to. Mark, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for checking out Innovations in Patient Care. Make sure you follow up on all of the other episodes. You can find those in iTunes, and they're also always linked over at the Physio Control Facebook page. I'm Jamie Davis, the Podmedic. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, make sure you remember to stay safe and stay tuned here to Innovations in Patient Care.